Welcome to Bespoken Bones with your host, Parvani More, connecting ancestors, sex, magic, and science. Parvani explores transpersonal tools for erotic wellness every new and full moon, engaging educators, healers, spiritual leaders, and scientists in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, ancestors at the crossroads of sex, magic, and science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. And I'm your host, Dr. Pavani Moray. And it's been so great to um, be in touch with so many of you. Thank you for all of the messages of support, the questions, the suggestions of people to have on this show. Really want to encourage people to keep reaching out. I know that these conversations are meaningful. I want to hear how they're landing for you. So um, there's a contact form on the bespokenbones.com website. You can reach me through that. I respond to all of the messages that I get. So please be in touch. It's such a delight and an honor um, to introduce you to today's guest, Dr. Alex Yantafi. Alex is the co-author of How to Understand Your Gender and Life Isn't Binary. They have researched and published extensively on gender, disability, sexuality, and relationship issues. Alex works as a therapist and a supervisor at their own clinical group practice, Edges Wellness Center, on Dakota and Anishinaabe territories, currently known as Minneapolis, Minnesota. And they are passionate about healing justice and writing as a form of personal and collective healing. And they actually have their own podcast, which is Gender Stories, and you should check that out. Um, And you can find out more about Alex on www. Alexiantafi.com. I'm going to spell it A L E X I A N T A F F I.com. Or you can follow them on Twitter, X Taffy, X T A F F I. And um, you can also check out Gender Stories, their website, which is buzzsprout.com backslash 156. 0 Alex, hi, welcome. So glad you're here. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I enjoy listening to it so much. And so I'm thrilled to be here with you today. It's a, it's a special treat for me too. And just, <laughs> uh, I hope it's okay to acknowledge that you and I go back a long way together. Oh, please. Yes. You, yeah. you are beloved to me. So absolutely. Yes. Acknowledge you your are, way. <laughs> you are beloved to me as well. As well. And, and interestingly, um, I don't know if you know this, but um, it was you who gave me permission for my own gender transformation in certain mm. ways, like um, around just like looking at you and being like, oh, that they can do it. They could do it in this like way that's non-binary and awesome mm. and rad and political and beautiful and hot and like, oh, and, and I could do that too, you know, so. Oh, you can see me blush, but I'm blushing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So welcome. Um, I, I'm just wondering, would you be willing you know, you're from Italy originally, Mm -hmm. would you be willing to pray? Yes, I have. uh, What I would like to do is actually share a prayer that I used to say every night as a child with my grandmother, um, which I feel is really, really does connect me to my ancestry. And that's going to be in Sicilian. And then I am going to do the rest of the prayer in English um, to be more accessible to the listeners. Does that sound okay? That sounds lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Io mi curco per dormire nello sonno posso morire Se ne arriva a confessore Perdonatemi signore Che subbede essi parole Ce l'hai scritto nel cuore O Maria o Sant'Anna Salvatemi starma My dear ancestors Of blood Of bone Of spirit Of witchcraft Of activism Of beautiful Gender and sexuality I ask of you to be here, to be here with me, and to be here with all of us, with Pavini, with me, with the listeners, and let whatever wisdom that needs to flow through, flow through for the blessing of all the listeners. 
Our relationship has not always been easy, especially with my most immediate ancestors of blood and bone. And yet I know that my connection is essential. My connection to ancestors is what allows me to be here. I am because my ancestors were. And so let this podcast be a blessing on all who listen. Let whomever ancestors need to come through, come through. And let us be together for this time. Thank you, ancestors. Grazie, grazie, grazie mille. Siete sempre con me. Lo so che siete con me nel mio sangue, nel mio spirito, nel mio fiato. Guidatemi, guidateci. Grazie. Grazie. Mm. Alex, um, maybe, you know, just for a little bit of context, would you just speak a little bit about your own you know, your own explorations with gender or kind of like mm -hmm. how you, not necessarily how you identify, but just, you know, to give a little bit of context for what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I'm also happy to share how I identify. It's it's really not a secret <laughs> to anybody. So I write about it and everything. Um, so how I identify now, and I say now because I really see gender as the journey of a lifetime, um, is as a non-binary trans-masculine uh, presenting by queer person. And I feel like that my gender journey is very much intertwined with all aspects of myself, including kind of um, my uh, cultural identity, my geographical uh, dislocation. And I call it dislocation because um, I am an immigrant and I've, I've lived as an immigrant since I was... Oh, when did I leave? I was 22. So I've lived as an immigrant for 26 years. So I've been an immigrant now for more years than I've been indigenous to a place uh, for the first 22 years of my life. And that is for me linked to my gender and sexuality. So it feels like an important piece kind of to name um, in terms of my journey. Great. Thank you. Tell me a little bit about your relationship with transestors and how you know they're real and, and what that relationship looks like, yeah? Mm -hmm, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, my relationship with transestors has been really essential to feeling a sense of belonging. I think, you know, like I said, I moved away from Italy and Southern Italy more specifically um, when I was 22. And um, part of my kind of moving away from home is complicated and has a lot to do with my more immediate family. And part of, of it definitely has to do with kind of gender and queerness. And so my relationship with ancestors has not always been straightforward because at times, you know, there are more immediate ancestors um, who were living in my lifetime who, who hurt me, right? And who directly um, hurt me because of my gender and sexuality. And so my relationship with ancestors um, has been fraught, but at the same time, it has been so essential for me to reclaim kind of my power and my strength and my beauty as a non-binary trans person. And uh, there is a story that does stand out for me. I mean, I've always known the ancestors were real, maybe because, you know, I lived with my grandma, uh, my maternal grandmother for a big portion of my life. And there were photos and candles and my grandma would talk to ancestors kind of every day. So for me, ancestors were kind of just an everyday reality growing up. And so I did feel their presence. But there is a, something that happened a few years ago. I was co-facilitating a movement workshop, actually, with uh, another beloved. And it was a movement workshop around um, uh, what in Sicily and also in uh, much of, in, like in Mexico, is Day of the Dead, uh, Samhain, basically that time here in the Northern Hemisphere when we feel we connect with ancestors and the veil is thin. And we were doing this workshop that was focused about on connecting with ancestors and um, we were doing this authentic movement exercise. And uh, to begin with, I was feeling kind of this experience of growing up and not feeling like there was space for me to be myself. And then there was this um, experience is the best <laughs> word that I can find for it. I felt the support of my ancestors so strongly, but not only the support, but a clear sense of belonging and I felt and I saw all these lines of ancestors stretching and I even saw them geographically stretching 
all across Sicily, connecting to the Balkans area where I also have ancestors from and feeling that ancestry, feeling the support of all the healers, all the queers, all the gender bending ancestors, all the outcast ancestors who also in their lifetime might have felt like they didn't belong. And those who knew that belonged because that belonged to a time where the wound of settler colonialism, of Christianization hadn't yet happened. And I felt so strong in every cell, in kind of every heartbeat, every, um, you know, in my blood, in my veins, in my bones, I knew that I belonged with all those ancestors. And I felt like a strength and a presence that has sustained me since in a way that... Um, yeah, it was kind of, in a way, that's almost hard to put into word because it was such a felt sense uh, in my body and a deep, deep knowing that even in my hardest moment of kind of doubt, I cannot shake, you know. And for me, that was a, that was a very powerful experience. Yeah, I, I'm so curious about that felt sense of belonging. Would you be willing to say a little bit more about, like, what did you notice when you, like, what does that feel like? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I know it's hard to put yeah. somatic stuff into words, but mm -hmm. like, like, yeah, what what is that feeling of belonging? Because I think so many folks, like, even sometimes when we have it, mm -hmm. we don't know it. Like, if, if we have outsider identities in particular, it's like we might totally belong, but we still can't feel it. Would you, can you speak to that? Mm -hmm. I can try, you know, yeah. but I'll do my best. But it was a real sense of, the best way I can describe it is that there was a sense of rightness, of ease. It was like my body was alert and present, but not tense. I could be, it was like my breath could um, fully fill up my whole body, my whole self, and no aspect of me needed to be um, held back or contracted. It was like I could be my right size in this moment, um, and knew my, and I knew my place in this line of ancestors, and and I knew kind of um, it was also very much a sense of connection. Like I really felt my spine feel very well aligned and strong and uh, I felt ta taller in my body, you know, and I felt um, very grounded, very present, like, you know, my weight was kind of fully on both of my feet and I felt like I, in that moment I could take on anything really. And it was amazing because, you know, for so many of us and at least for me and I know for many folks that I work with, it's so hard to have that foul sense of right size, of belonging, of connection, because often our experiences of ancestors are with more recent ancestors who were maybe living in our lifetime who may not have been as embracing of us um, as maybe our bright and well ancestors are. Yeah, as, I, as I'm listening to you, I'm just... I'm, um remembering something that another guest, Sandra Easter, talked about, about like the um, the connection to the land as a piece of the mm -hmm. ancestral healing, like feeling. And I just, I think that like, I'm curious of what you have to say about like, because um, so many folks who are living in North America are not indigenous mm -hmm. to here, obviously, right? And it's how do you feel that sense of belonging when you, like your ancestors actually um we're in a place that they didn't belong. And so they're by, by default than you are, you know what I mean? You mm -hmm. kind of just like, Absolutely. you're living with this legacy of like either through um, colonization or through slavery, you know, there's been mm -hmm. this, this way that these, all these bodies are deposited on this land. Mm -hmm. And how do you. Yeah, no, I'm glad you asked me that question because another important part of that experience that I was talking about um, was that the, it was very um I don't often get visuals in my work. And so to get such a strong visual of my ancestors, it was because they wanted me to have a strong sense of belonging to place. Like I could see the line of my ancestors, you know, extending from Sicily and the Southern Mediterranean and across the Balkans, which is where my ancestry is from. And um, I also had a, the other part of the, that experience was definitely a strong sense of, and now you're here and uh, there is a piece of work that you are 
um, position to do because of your um, of your location, right? And for me, that piece of work um, has been really interesting because I do have a sense of belonging to place and being indigenous to place, being having been brought up in Italy and especially having spent um, a lot of time growing up, even though I was going to school in Rome, all of our time was really spent in Sicily where my mother is from and my maternal grandmother is from. And if I had to say that I belong to a place, I do belong to where my mom is from in Sicily. And I have a deep, deep sense of belonging to that land and a, a sense of um, indigeneity to that to place. And when, uh, you know, I've been here in what we now call the United States, and specifically on the Kodani Shinabe land and what currently is known as Minneapolis, Minnesota, for 11 years. And one of the questions I've asked myself and again, again and again is what does it mean to be here and what does it mean to build a relationship with place here, um, given the history of uh, settler colonialism that is in this place? And I know that a piece for me has been to um, not become assimilated into whiteness, resisting this disease of white supremacy, um, the, which does feel like a disease. Um, and it and it's so clear to me that it's a disease, and I use the word disease really intentionally because there is also like, it's literally a lack of ease, right? A lack of belonging. It's a, mm. it's a wound, right? When people say, I'm white, what they're saying is I'm a product of settler colonialism and I have lost touch with the language and the culture and the sense of belonging to my ancestors often, yeah, right? Yeah. And and whiteness is created in uh, as a tool of anti-blackness, right? There can be no whiteness that it's not rooted in anti-blackness. And so it's so complex. And I hope that I'm, I'm putting things across in the right way. But I know that one of the things I heard so clearly from my ancestors is uh, you need to remember where you come from and that you have ancestry and you have you do belong, you have language, you know what it's like to be brought up with ancestors all around you, you have traditions, you have customs, you have a clear sense of uh, cultural, you have a clear cultural identity and you have clear geographical belonging. And yes, you are displaced because of your transness and queerness and, and economic status and, and lots of other complicated reasons. And now you're in this place where people have been displaced for so long that they've forgotten that they do belong also to their ancestors. And this is complicated because I'm also not of the school of you can only practice um, you know, traditions that are of your genetic ancestors, because for me, that's very, very close to purity culture, which is very close to fascism, right? In Europe, that is actually used against people. When I had an interest in the runes and Norse mythology, and I was still living in the UK, because I lived in the UK as an immigrant first before coming here, I was literally told, you cannot study the runes, you're not Aryan, those are not of your people, um, you know, you need to stick with Mediterranean gods um, and not kind of your, our gods are not your gods, which is also like really ignorant of history, given the history of kind of Vikings being in, in Sicily and like the complicated uh, DNA that we have on the island, really. So I'm not advocating for purity uh, of tradition, but I think that as humans, we do need to remember that all of our ancestors eventually come from a place where they did belong. And that displacement, whether mm. it was dis displacement through force or whether it was displacement through circumstances or whether it was even displacement through greed, right? In terms of uh, folks who have maybe um, wealthier ancestors who came to kind of build that wealth. Uh, there was a time at some point in your line where your ancestors were indigenous to place. And so what are you going to do? What am I going to do? What are we going to do to honor that and to remember that? Because I think if we are going to move toward healing, if we I, decolonizing has become such a buzzword that I'm even really hesitant to use it as somebody who's walking around in white skin. But if we really are to kind of uh, look at the truth of what settler colonialism has done to all of us, we need to um, 
deal with the grief. I think that one of the yeah. things that I see a lot here is just this grief, this lack. It's like a black hole, right? It's like, how are you going to feel belonging if you don't know where you belong, if you don't know where you're from, if you don't know who your people are, if there isn't a, a sense of connection, you know, and and where there is, you know, and, and often also um, folks who are acculturated in kind of this Anglo whiteness don't have the deals to deal with grief or to deal with death. Like the the prayer that I used at the beginning is a prayer that I used to say every night with my maternal grandmother, and basically says, "I go to sleep. Um, I go. To, I get into this bed to sleep." But if I die without being able to confess my sins, I hope you will forgive me, Creator. And then it prays to Mary and Saint Anne to save, to save my soul, basically. And it's like I was brought up with this knowing that the only thing that is certain in our life is that we're going to die and we're going to join the ancestors. And even though it's scary, there are ancestors, right, that we are walking to do- towards that are going to welcome us. And I didn't even realize the depth of that gift until I was um, living as an immigrant. And it took me over 20 years, really, to realize that other people were not brought up with this familiarity with death familiarity with ancestors, right? Anglo white folks often don't have a lot of fear, um, haven't been brought up thinking about death very much. And I know these are big generalization and it's not true for everybody, but I think that's definitely part of that wound. And so when there is a separation from death, um, there is a separation from ancestors, there is a separation from land, um, then it becomes easier to other people and to even other parts of ourselves, if that makes sense. I don't know if I'm making sense, so I'm going to stop and take a breath. Yeah, it's so good. It's so good how you're weaving it all together. It's really, really good. I don't think I had um, put together those pieces about um, ease and belonging, and mm-hmm. that like if dis-ease and disbelonging go together, then ease and belonging go together, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, and absolutely. yeah, I'm just thinking of this like um, this moment where my ancestors were talking to me, and they um, they said, you know, this is the most important thing. Like, connect reconnecting with ancestors is the most the mm-hmm. most important. Like, they were very explicit with the definitive article, the yes. most um, important piece of healing uh, humans need to do. And I was like, really? Like, I mean, there's a lot of healing we need to do, and they were like, nope. This is the mm-hmm. thing. And I was like, all right, all right. Um, but when I hear you talk, right, mm-hmm. what I'm putting together is that it 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 is the most important thing because if we reconnect, you said um, that there is a time in all of our lineages where our ancestors belonged and they knew that sense of belonging, right? Yeah. And that, that in a sense, whiteness and blackness are they're mutually like those constructs are mutually dependent, right? And for whiteness to be deconstructed, like we have to figure out how to belong again, right? We have to feel not just like like intellectually, but how to like this thing that you're talking about, this felt, this deep somatic felt sense of belonging, right? To our well lineages is what um, there's a there's a corrective here, right? There's a way mm-hmm. to to course correct this trajectory that we're on by finding. Um, the sense of belonging to lineage, to lands, to tr- culture, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that even, you know, for a lot of people, it's hard, right? Because they don't know where their ancestors come from and they don't necessarily, and also there are a lot of mixing of lineages, right? This is something yeah. that's, you know, that is happening more and more, you know, with the ease of transport. And definitely here in what we call the United States, that is a, an essential element of what happened here in some ways. And so it's also okay if people um, really kind of tap into the, the wisdom of their ancestors and are guided by that wisdom towards the practices that are going to be nurturing their soul, but also they're going to be nurturing of the generations to come, right? So this mm-hmm. doesn't have to be perfect because I think another aspect of the disease of whiteness is the yearn for perfectionism. Yeah. And so often I see this purity culture, this perfectionism, which I think is actually really insidious. And so I want to make sure that I do say that this is not about being perfect or even being absolutely right. It's just really about 
um, tapping into that wisdom that the ancestors have and that is available to us if we only connect and if we let ourselves connect. And also how important it is to build relationship with indigenous uh, people who are currently living on the land we're living on, right? Like I want to learn more about the Dakota and Anishinaabe histories. I want to go and uh, support the work of indigenous artists and indigenous activists here. And I want to kind of support um, my the local indigenous community that lives kind of a mile away, you know, from my house. I want to be present. I don't want to kind of ignore that reality that the ongoing settler colonial project is not finished. It's ongoing. Indigenous people are still actively being displaced every day that they do not have sovereignty. And so another part of the healing is to never forget that we are living in an ongoing settler colonial project in this place, in this time. And so how will we show up? How will we be present to that reality, if that makes sense? It does. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your activism. Um, this is one of the ways that I know you best, actually. <laughs> um, and, and I know you, you, your activism is on multiple fronts. It's magical and spiritual. It's also pragmatic. It's, um, there's, there's lots of ways that you're enacting it. Yeah. And I, the question is really about, um, focusing in on the, the trans, ancestors, the transgender ones, the mm-hmm. gender blessed ones, all of those of like those relationships that maybe are of blood, but most, you know, most, the mm-hmm. ones that we know most about are not of blood, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how does that connection that you have with those activist ancestors, those those trans activist ancestors, how does it inform your activism now? Like, how is it, mm. um, how does it support it? How do you relate with them? Yeah, anything there? Yeah, I mean, I know so much. Um, You know, I think my activism is very much rooted in my kind of uh, Sicilian and even values, which is how do I live my life every day, right? How do I show up with my family? How do I clean my house? How do I cook my meals? Where does my food come from? How do I show up to my healing work as a therapist and my training work as a supervisor? All those kind of things. That's that my activism is deeply rooted in that. And um, I think where trans ancestors of activism uh, for me are essential is that I, I, you know, I rely on them to remind me that um, in some ways, I could get comfortable, right, in my life and be like, I'm okay. I'm in this country where having white skin automatically gives me privilege. And I know because, like, I didn't have it in the UK and then I did. You know, I had I had some level of privilege, but it was different. Um, and I could just get comfortable. I could also choose to pass if I wanted to. I could do more body modification and choose to pass even more. And there is something... Um, that trans ancestors have taught me about assimilation not being the goal, right? When I think about, it is 50 years of Stonewall. When I think about Marsha P. Johnson, when I think about Sylvia Rivera, when I think about Brenda Howard, when I think about all of those people, this women, you know, trans women of color, uh, Brenda was a working class white woman. When I think about this women, I think about assimilation was not their goal. The intrinsic recognition of their humanity was the goal. And intrinsic recognition of our humanity is very different than assimilating into a patriarchal, settler colonial, cis heteronormative, ableist paradigm, right? It's it's about actually actively resisting that paradigm. So for me is how do I actively resist that paradigm every day in how I show up to my work? And um and part of what I feel it's really important is to um help people have a real relationship, a real stake into our liberation. So when I'm thinking about gender liberation, of course, trans feminine people of color are bearing the brunt of the systemic oppression of a rigid gender binary, right? And therefore my activism does need to center trans feminine folks of color. You know, a lot of my, um, you know, where I I put my money towards, where I kind of want to put my support towards is kind of transferring a color being at the center of our movement. 
And the other part is really kind of um, helping people realize that no matter what their gender identity or expression, they have a stake in gender liberation, that this is something that is relevant to all of us, you know, in a, in a similar way that I believe we cannot truly um, support kind of racial justice and racial liberation if we don't understand how uh, white skin folks are also impacted and hurt by anti-blackness and white supremacy. Um, you know, I feel like our liberation, which is something that I have very much been taught um, by black women and women of color, is truly intrinsically bound to one another. And that's where I have like so much gratitude for all those activists, all those writers, and they are predominantly uh, black and Latinx um, women and femmes that really have taught me that, that we cannot just look at one aspect. We cannot just sanitize our movement. We cannot just silently and quietly assimilate and push those of us who might be seen as freak and different to the end of the line again and again and again, as it has been happening over the last 50 years and more. But we actually... I uh, really need to understand how all of those things are intrinsically linked to one another, how, you know, um, there cannot be any gender liberation without kind of racial justice, without disability justice, like all those things without um, economic justice, all those things are connected together without um, the recognition of indigenous sovereignty. I don't know if I'm making sense or if I'm just like going off on a tangent, <laughs> but here you, you know me, I can go off. <laughs> oh my gosh, Alex, when I was, um, when I was researching for this, this interview, I was looking at your list of publications. Like, I mean, I knew you were an academic and an activist, but I was like, holy <laughs> moly, this person has published a lot, you know? Um, like, wow. Just thank you. Thank you for all of the work that you do and um, the fierce commitment to the liberation of all. It feels really beautiful to um, to have a living role model of that. Um, that's that's also like you know an amazing cook and an amazing um, <laughs> is so generous with your love and your attention, your heart and your glitter. You're like you're super generous. And um, one of the ways that I see you being generous is you have a podcast called Gender Stories, um, where you really make a space uh, in the world mm -hmm. for people to talk about this. And I just would love to hear um, like you know w why Gender Stories and and um, what is it and what happens there? And, um, you know, what is the the longing in you that it's feeding? Mm, yes, I know. Why am I doing a podcast? I do ask myself that often. It really, podcasts are really a labor of love, honestly. Well, um, recently, um, you know, somebody asked, like, who is the audience for, for your podcast? And I was like, well, everybody who's as fascinated by uh, the complexity, what I really wanted to see is how weird gender is, you know, gender is this thing that I've always <laughs> been fascinated by, right? Gender is so weird, at least for me, it was always this mystery. Like I remember being seven years old and kind of passing as a boy and being very excited to pass as a boy and going, wow, gender is so weird. If I cut my hair this way, if I wear this clothes instead of those clothes, people are talking to me in a different way. And of course, it would be years until I found feminist theory, right? And started to make sense of this wild concept of gender. And it has been quite the trip, right? Because for a long time, I was also like, what is um, wrong with me? Maybe I've internalized misogyny and I have to love my womanness. And it took me a long time to was like, well, I can't love my womanness because I'm not a woman. But uh, um can I love my non-binariness in a world where basically it's almost impossible to be in this liminal space in lots of different ways? So for me, the Gender Stories podcast was really an outlet. A, people kept telling me like, I love your voice. I could listen to you forever. You should have a podcast, you know, and if people tell you something long enough, you're like, Oh, well, I do enjoy podcasts and I am an opinionated person. I could, I could talk, you know, on the regular in front of a microphone. And I know a lot of awesome people who I really want to lift up, you know. So the whole premise of gender stories is really that everybody has a relationship with gender and I'm interested in their stories. So I think what's um, a little bit unique about my podcast is that uh, even though 
I do interview many trans and non-binary folks. I also interview cis folks about their relationship with gender and different aspects of it, right? I interviewed my friend Erica, who's like a Emmy award-winning documentarian and businesswoman about, and a, and a very open kind of survivor about what it's like to be a woman in business and a survivor and kind of all these disp- different aspects of her identity. And my friend Arike, who does a lot of work around political healing and what does it mean to be a political healer, you know, as a cis uh, woman of color. So what I'm really interested in is we all have a relationship with gender. That relationship is complex because it's not just with our own felt sense of gender, but it's also with cultural and social constructs of gender. So it's it's almost like gathering around uh, the fireplace with a bunch of people who are like, ooh, gender, isn't it a fascinating thing? Let's talk about all sorts of different aspects. Like the last episode I put out for PTSD Awareness Month is about complex PTSD and what does gender have to do with complex PTSD? You know, and I've had some amazing responses and it's really, um, you know, and I've interviewed writers and musicians and like I said, business folks and community organizers um, about why is gender relevant to their lives and their work. And what I'm hoping to do is create a conversation around gender that is engaging for everybody so that people can be like, oh, this is something that exists in the world and I have a stake in and I get to reflect on what does it mean and how, um, you know, the way that we think about gender, what does it open up and what does it close down, right? Is there a different way of thinking about gender? Is there a way that's less binary, less polarized, which of course is also the premise of the latest book that I wrote with Mac John, Life Isn't Binary, which is not just about gender or sexuality, is can we think in a um, non-binary way about around our relationship, our bodies, our emotions, you know, So basically, my podcast is just this passion I have to bring this fascination I have with gender that led me to do a whole PhD in what was then called women's studies, because I am that old. It was still women's studies, not gender studies. And I was brought up a second wave feminist, which is interesting as a trans person. (laughs) Um, You know, so I'm very familiar with that. So for me, it's like, let's all talk about gender together. Let's have a conversation about the complexity of this biopsychosocial construct in a way that's accessible. I don't know. Does that give you? Yeah, it's beautiful. Thank you. Maybe that scares people away from my podcast. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's great. You know, and I, I think there's like this, you know, kind of like that whole, like, I don't see color. It's like a post-racial world. Like, mm-hmm. I feel like that's also true about gender, right? Like, yes. we're in a post-gender world. Like, you know, and, mm-hmm. and I love that you're like, oh, actually, no, let's, no. <laughs> let's stop <laughs> and dive in even deeper, you know, to the mysteries of gender, right? Right, because people are like, look at Lego or target is not like dividing clothing by gender i'm like people this goes so deep it's gonna take so much longer than target degendering their bathrooms but there you go oh i didn't even know that they did that awesome target way I to go that that. i don't know there was an article i could be wrong <laughs> yeah oh the the freaking gender binary oh my god um i want to talk with you actually about the the mystery of it about you know i have this sense I want to be careful because I don't want to like go into a whole like chosen people narrative, (laughs) but I, but I have the sense that like, that being, that being trans, being gender blessed, like there's this special access point, like you said, to the liminal, to, um, to the, the old gods, to the, you know, Mm -hmm. there's this way of, um, the, the powerful magic of, of fucking with gender. Right. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, and other guests have talked about this, but like, you know, kind of where I see a, um, like, I love, uh, black girl magic. I just, I'm, I just, you know, it's like, fuck yes. Yes. You know? And, and I kind of feel that about trans magic of like the forgetting, the cultural forgetting, you named this Mm -hmm. earlier, right. Of like that, that's the, um, 
it's the great tool of of patriarchy is like oh just like it's so seductive just, just like forget your power forget your magic right and then yes. like when people come together and they're like oh wait 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 do you remember this do you remember oh, what what was that you know what was that one ritual like remember what our ancestors and like this this power of the of the collective remembering in these outsider experiences um it's like what patriarchy where'd it go you know um and so i just wonder if like what would you say about for the gender blessed crew of like remembering your magic remembering the power of of this liminality that you um that you hold in your body yeah Mm, yes, I think, and, and I totally hear you on that. Let's be careful that it's not about being the, the chosen people, right? Because I do really believe that we are all gender blessed, right? That I really think that when we embrace kind of our gender fully, like who we are is a blessing, right? We are a blessing, um, you know, of our ancestors. And hopefully the way we choose to live, we will be a blessing to any descendants, you know, not just descendants of blood, but also descendants of activism. And so for me, it's like, what's interesting is that often people ask me because of my job, uh, both young people and parents, but also trans adults, like, why am I trans or why am I non-binary, right? Why am I this way? And I always say, you know, the best evidence we have is from history. There, always, there have always been gender expansive people all across time and space, you know. And every morning I do pray to all the mysterious ones, all the ancestors of transness and queerness and gender exp expansiveness across time and space and all those who support this work, right? And... Um, and for me, that says something like we have always existed. We have existed in every time and in every place. And often when we delve into what we know historically is that oftentimes, especially folks, and I would say especially folks who were not, uh, who were in a more non-binary space, let's call it, in a more liminal space, um, because there's also kind of trans folks who have a, a more kind of binary identity and that's okay you know and it's like but this liminal space was also a space of uh, spirituality for uh, in a lot of places and at different times right uh, for example if i think about the galli which were the priestesses of the frisian goddess Cibele, um they were mostly assigned male birth and presented in feminine clothes and during the Roman Empire, one of their, um, one of the jobs they performed in society was really to speak truth to power and to really kind of uh, mock the ways that power was being corrupted uh, at the time, right? So there is this political, spiritual role that uh, trans and or non-binary folks seem to have across time and space. And again, I want to be careful, like you said, that we don't go into like being chosen. But I think it's just a role, right? If we think about a well-rounded kind of social grouping, we need all the roles, right? If you just have folks who are like political and spiritual, we might never eat anything and uh, we might never get clothed. You know, like we, we need all, we need everything. We need everything in balance, right? This is just a role and it's not any more special because it's spiritual and or political, right? But there is something about uh, trans and or non-binary folks being, um, I used to say the uh, wild weeds of resistance, but uh, another beloved sibling of mine and elder Donald Engstrom Reese, who was also a horticulturalist, was like, weeds actually don't resist, they restore. So I really think that trans and non-binary folks are the weeds of restoration. We are really like calling people to remember the gender is so much more expansive that this um, patriarchal, you know, cisgenderist, settler colonial ideal of the rigid gender binary would have us believe. And I really do believe that a rigid gender binary is a, a product of Christianization, is a product of settler colonialism, and it's an ongoing product of that ongoing settler colonial project. So trans and non-binary people are those weeds of restoration of gender. Gender is meant to be expansive. Gender is meant to be liminal at times. And this expansiveness 
often for folks who do feel a sense of connection to something greater than us also connects us to whatever we might describe as spirit, spirit, creator, mystery, right? Something that's bigger than us and cannot be confined into a rigid gender binary. You know, something that is as so much more breadth and depth and um, expansiveness. That's why I love that word gender expansive rather than gender non-conforming. I think gender expansive folks uh, keep bringing the blessings of the ancestors forward to kind of help us remember in the sense of really reconstitute ourselves, not just as individual, but collectively as um, having potential uh, to be more than we are right now. I love it. I love being the weeds of restoration. I'm I'm in the right? weeds. <laughs> I'm in there. I'm in there with you. Um, yeah. Yeah, I want to I want to finish by asking you about sex, Alex. Like you have, mm -hmm. you know, you've done ton of work around sexuality and around sexual liberation and um I was really hoping that you might tell a story. Yes, I would love to. Um you know, I was thinking about this the other day because I went to see this beautiful production at Fiera Ladida of To Let Go and Fall, which is all about this beautiful uh, interracial couple of dancers and their relationship to the HIV crisis at the beginning and then kind of 20 years later. And that really um, supported my thinking about how I came of age around sex and sexuality. And I was brought up in a very unwell household when it comes to sexuality. And then in my teenage years was when the HIV crisis kind of hit the news. So I came from this, um, you know, culturally unwell household around sex and sexuality into a culturally unwell world, which basically told us that to have sex was to die. And in Italy, it really was like that straightforward. If you have sex outside marriage, you will get HIV and die. If you do drugs, you will die. If you're queer, you will die. And that's, um, that's a really traumatic way, honestly, to come into sex and sexuality. So I think that part of my fascination with sex and sexuality has been driven by my desire to heal. And I think that the desire to heal has been very much driven by the strength of my ancestors who remember and reminded me that sex is essential. Sex is life force. You know, if we don't tap into... Um, this life force, then what are we doing? You know, to um, to be connected to sex is to be connected to ourselves, to our living blood, to our breath, to our creativity, to our capacity to connect with ourselves and with other human beings, right? And that doesn't even mean that we need to have sex. It's really is about this vitality. You know, when when I'm looking at a tree blooming and, you know, butterflies stopping on flowers and bees. It's like sex is all around us and we make it this thing that is so, um, uh, that it needs to be kept away, you know, into this tight little box, but sex is so expansive. Similarly to gender, sex is so expansive and it's really, it's about our life force. And so where was I going? I think there was a story and then I got lost into my trajectory and then I was having beautiful <laughs> it's pictures okay. of monarch butterflies. It like, got all um, eco-erotic around here. It's it all good. Really it's all did. good. Yeah. That's great. It did get really eco-erotic for a minute there. And I was like, I think I was going to tell a story about sex. And I think I need to have any tell me the question again. Yeah. Tell us a story <laughs> about sex and queerness and ancestors. Oh, there you go. Sex and queerness and ancestors. And so I was thinking about, um, you know, um, what's it like then to come from this place where we are being taught that to be queer, that to have sex is dangerous, to a place of reclaiming, you know, our queerness and um, reclaiming also our grief as a as a movement, you know. I am of the generation who knows that we lost like a game of age as we were losing all, all the adults, all the queer adults. You know, not everybody, but so many people died during the HIV crisis, right? There was so much death. But um, when I think about it, we, 
you know, that is a huge loss. That's a huge trauma that we suffered as a queer community and that has led to a lack of intergenerational community. But what I've been connecting more and more as I get older, you know, I'm like adding towards my 50s now, um, I've been thinking about, so what are the blessing and the gifts of those ancestors? Yes, they're not living anymore, but is there a way that I can connect to those ancestors. And so I think that reclaiming vitality, reclaiming sex and sexuality is so important for us trans and or queer folks. I mean, it's really important for everybody, but trans and queer folks are like my main communities. And uh, there's a special tender spot in my heart for my communities. And I think, um, you know, we have just been so hurt by those stories that connected sex with death and we've been lied to. And uh, I think our ancestors often remind us, no, sex is about vitality. Sex is about fully being alive in our bodies. Sex is our capacity to be fully embodied. Whatever we decide to do with that, you know, we may be asexual and not want or feel like we have any need to have sex with another person, but to be fully alive in our bodies. That to me is what sex magic is for. And I think that is so much at the heart of so much of my work, whether it's academic work, whether it's writing, whether it's healing work with clients as a sex therapist or teaching about sex, is can I support people in connecting to sex as this expansive construct that we can always tap into to connect to a sense of vitality and something that helps us nourish and sustain us as we go through life, as we walk towards our ancestors. I don't know if I'm making sense. I guess it's not a specific story, but it's more like how I think about sex and sex magic. Well, I have a story. Great. (laughs) It involves you and me and Wolf Creek and ancestors and sex and queerness. Oh, yeah. Does it feel okay to talk about that? I'm okay to talk about that. Yeah, because I think you can probably help me remember that um, you and I were with uh, another beloved and Mm -hmm. we um, we were in the woods and we were in a container that was designed for uh, sacred sexuality play. And, mm-hmm. um, and I just remember that like we were, you know, we were playing and, um, and, and you started praying, you started mm-hmm. praying out loud to the, and we were on lands where, um, there's a lot of, uh, AIDS dead ashes, the, the ashes of folks who died in the epidemic are on mm-hmm. that lands. And you and I were on that lands and we were in this, in this magic way. And, um, we were we were making a little love and um, yeah and you started praying out loud to them. Do you remember this? I don't remember this, but that happens to me sometimes. That uh, you know the spirit moves me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I you know when I used to be a Christian, I might have been a little like Pentecostal. The spirit moves me and shit comes out, and I, I don't remember it. But you were there, so go for I was it. <laughs> there. Yeah, and you just you just started praying out loud to them to the to the ancestors, and you were telling them to you know take what they needed, like that you were. Yeah, gift. It was like the gifts of the body, the gifts of the pleasure, the gifts of the, of the sex magic. You were like, here's here's this beautiful gift we have for you. Please take it. Take what you need. Take all you need. I'm giving it to you freely. You know, it was so gorgeous, and it moved me. You know, in so many ways of like thinking about that connection with with sex and ancestors, and and how our our living sex, the sex that we have in these mm. living bodies. Um, is a is a way to access prayer is a way to access um, healing and um, yeah that all oh, came that's so beautiful I'm so yeah. glad you remember that <laughs> <laughs> but I but it's so relevant because honestly I do feel like when I'm at my most embodied and my most present and especially on like sacred sites like Wolf Creek right which I do think of as a sacred site in many way for queerness. Um, it's a prayer, you know, it's like when, when we're fully embodied in that way, whether we're having sex, whether we're exchanging breath with the tree, whether we're growing milkweed in our yards, like that's a, our sex is a prayer, you know, and, um, 
and it and it heals um it heals us it heals our communities um you know and if we and if we really can look at the aspect of ecosexuality, it also heals the land, right? If we can see the land as living, breathing, beautiful, um, life-giving um, being that nourishes and nurtures us, that that also um, that also heals us. Actually, the land doesn't need healing, but it heals our relationship with the land, which has been disrupted. Alex, I want to just offer so much gratitude for um, coming on Bespoken Bones and talking with us about these things. And um, it's such a delight and honor to to talk with you and, and to hear kind of the work that you've been doing. Oh, thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I love your podcast and I often recommend it to everybody, to people <laughs> in community, to my clients when they're doing ancestral work. I'm like, go listen to Bespoken Bones. <laughs> it. It's awesome. And everybody comes back and go like, yes, that was a great recommendation. So it's it's such great. an honor for I'm me. Glad. To be- yeah. And so let me just tell folks again how to get in touch with you and your work. Mm-hmm. Um, you have a website. Uh Alex Yantafi.com. Yeah. I do. And I'm going to spell it A L E X I A N T A F F I.com. And then your um, Gender Stories website is buzzsprout.com 156032. I think actually there's an easier one, but it's like basically if you Google gender stories podcast, you'll find us. Great. Perfect. (laughs) Um, And then, um, and folks can connect with you on Twitter. um, X Taffy. Yes. X T A F F I. Yes. There's also an at gender stories, both on Twitter and on Instagram. And there's a page on Facebook. Great. Okay. And so folks can get in contact with you that way. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So much thanks. And thanks folks for listening to this episode. And um, if you feel inspired by this conversation, uh, just, you know, offering that there's more available on Alex's website, on my website, emancipating-sexuality.com. You can learn more there about the sexuality work that I offer. Um, and just want to hear from you. I want to hear how this is landing. So feel free to drop a line. I am Pavani More, and I will be back every full and new moon with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. Mm-hmm.